Welcome to the fifth episode of our special edition MindShift video series. I'm Dimitri Wakov, and as some of you know, the purpose of MindShift is to help you create these atomic shifts in your mind so that you can leave your creative genius and start living your life with more prosperity, fulfillment, and appreciation. The topic for today is cross-cultural mastery. And I'm so excited about it because in nowadays when the world is like a one country, when we live, we interact with people from different cultures, it's so important for us to know how to do that. And if you, for example, we are starting a new job in another country or with people from different cultures, you are moving to another country, you are coming back from your own, to your own country from many years abroad, this topic it will be really relevant for you and our expert today will give you so many tips how can you can adapt and how you can be more happy in these situations i'm going to give the word to my wonderful co-host laura petroskaite to introduce our cross-cultural mastery expert and mind shifter today and we'll start the interview hey laura thank you dimi and uh, I have a pleasure to present our lovely guest today, Patty McCarthy. And uh, Patty is herself a lifelong expat. She has in 2008 uh, founded her own business called Cultural Chemistry. She also is the author of this lovely book, Cultural Chemistry, that I am about to read. And I'm extremely excited to do that. And actually on purpose, I chose to hold back to first have a conversation with Pathy and then dig into the book. Uh, Pathy as, uh, as well is um, a coach, a neuro-linguistic programming practitioner. She works with a global disc as well. And she's just all around brilliant person. And <laughs> I have a big honor um, to welcome you to the show, Pathy. And I think to start with, the very first question would be cultural chemistry. Why is your business called Cultural Chemistry? <laughs> well, thanks for that lovely introduction. And uh, I'm excited at the prospect of being a mind shifter. That, that, <laughs> that makes me feel very powerful. So, <laughs> um, Why Cultural Chemistry? Because I think chemists look at how they can combine elements and get a really good outcome. And often there's a lot of, um, you know, a bit more of this, a bit less of that. And sometimes two elements will explode and sometimes you combine in it and it makes something beautiful like hydrogen and oxygen make water. So, um, so what, what I like to think of is with, between people, if you get people who are very different, how can you kind of adjust the balance a bit to get a better outcome? So if you get someone who is really formal and someone who is really informal, well, where's the sweet spot that they can find that allows both of them to feel comfortable in that relationship? And that's really what I do with people. I help people you know, to look for that sweet spot and to think about how they can arrive at that place so that they can create something good and positive um, rather than, than struggle with the differences. So. I think that's brilliant. And also what is interesting is we can just take personalities alone and that's already a challenge sometimes so i believe when we add the extra layer of cultures the whole game yeah. becomes even more interesting yeah so yeah what i would be really interested in is actually to speak about those simple strategies for bridging the cultural gap and in other words would be how to actually establish yourself efficiently and happily in the in the new environment in the in the different culture be it moving abroad or starting to work with different cultures what would be your your key advice um okay so there's quite a lot <laughs> not there so um <laughs> let, let's say um from a work point of view first of all although in a way look the in, you kind of mentioned that i've written a book and because i'm a coach um i didn't want to just write a book about cultural differences. I wanted to provide a coaching model that people could use to help them resolve um, antagonistic situations that they found themselves in. So I came up with a model called the four R's and 
to be honest, it probably works in, in all kinds of situations, as you said, sometimes just between personality types that are different. So, and the four R's stand for rewards, research, reflect, and reach out. So what those mean, what that means sort of in practice is you focus first of all on the rewards, what's to be gained from improving this situation. And for an individual in a workplace, it might be that you can develop better relationships with colleagues. You can get on with your boss better. You can be a better boss. You can harness the ideas and innovation of other people in your team. Your workplace is more enjoyable because you're not stressed about being different all the time. You understand how to get on. You can work more effectively with people from a number of different cultural backgrounds. You become the kind of go-to person for putting into difficult situations. You know, there are, there are many benefits. And on a personal side, if you are an expatriate, the same applies. If you, you actually think about, well, what's to be gained? You know, I've moved to this new country. I want to make a whole load of new friends. I want to get networked. I maybe want to get, you know, the accompanying partner I might be looking for, for work. So think about your what your rewards are. And it, I mean, it's classic goal setting in coaching is we actually sort of hold up this trophy and say, you know, if you do this, you'll, you'll get that. So, um, but I think it's really worth doing because actually if you sit down and list all the things that you want and all the things that are to be gained from investing some time in this, then you quickly see that it's worth doing. So then the second stage research is really about, well, what do you need to know given the situation? So, so in a workplace, it might be looking at things like communication differences, you know, office etiquette, you know, if you make a cup of coffee, do you have to wash your own cup? Or, you know, does someone else come along and wash it for you? Does someone else come along and make your coffee for you? You know, so, um, so I had a, a client who moved to India and, there was a tea boy who came around with a trolley a couple of times a day, but he said the coffee was just sort of undrinkable and he had this sort of dilemma of, well, how do I actually not offend the tea boy, um, but actually have decent coffee? So, and it was classic, you know, cultural chemistry sort of situation, you know, so, so what he did was he brought a little Nespresso in, you know, machine into the office and then he asked the boy to make the coffee for him using his machine. So, you know, everyone's sort of, everyone's role was respected and my client, you know, got the outcome he wanted, but the tea boy was not upset, but, you know, and that, but, you know, similarly, you know, that classic store in a teacup phrase that often the biggest problems will start in the kitchen and people will say, oh, you know, she never washes a cup or there was a story I heard um, about some um, Chinese cleaners in Singapore um, no, sorry, there were a, a, a Muslim cleaner who worked in an office in Singapore and she wouldn't clean the microwave because so many pork dishes were heated up in it. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, there are all kinds of issues that, you know, we could sort of get down to, but um, I'm digressing, <laughs> which I tend to do. But, uh, you know, it's think about, well, what are the differences that I need to be aware of in, in my workplace? And it is, you know, is my style of management, my style of leadership, um, the way that I, um, that I manage the team here, um, the communication style I use, the difference between the maybe the way men and women are, are treated in the workplace, um, what are those differences that I need to be aware of? And, and of course, the same personally. So if you are um, a fairly um, shy, retiring type and you move to somewhere like America where people are very comfortable with self-promoting, uh, you know, that you've got to be aware that if someone says to you, or, you know, where did you where did you go to school you know that you know you say oh well and I went to this high school in in Beijing and you know and they say unhappy you know what did you what was your best subject oh well you know I you know I just tried to to be good at everything whereas the American will be saying oh my best subject was history and I was always top of the class for it and I went on to you know brown school and I got a scholarship and you know and, and you know blah 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 in a way that we would just think, oh, you know, we wouldn't do that. But um, you know, one of the things I quite like to ask people is, if someone asks you how much your shirt cost, is that rude to you? 
and you know if someone asks you who you vote for or who did you vote for in the last election you know do you are you comfortable telling me or not and it's those kind of little conversations that people suddenly think oh like this is i would never do this and we, we had an experience in my book club in Australia and one of the girls was a French girl and the night of the election she came along and said so you know who did everyone vote for and everyone oh like you know like because we just don't talk about it in Australia but in France it's very common to be very out there with with conversations like that so 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 lots to 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 research and to think about the reflection piece is also really important I'd say as important as the research because it's actually learning about yourself and you know maybe what is there about you that other people might struggle with, but also how are you responding to the difference? Do you feel unpleasantly challenged by it? Do you think that, oh, well, I'm right and, and they're wrong and my way is better? Do you kind of make assumptions, judge things by your own values? Um, and you have to be really careful of, of not doing that, of, of assuming that someone else's behavior, like for example, if a Chinese person is reluctant to self-promote, that that means that they haven't done anything of, of merit. You know, we can sort of, we judge people very quickly by our own, by our own values and standards. So, um, so probably by the end of that sort of period of reflection, you'll have realized that, mm, okay, so it's not all them and I've got some work to do as well. So then the last R is reach out and it's talking about, you know, what can you do to make a connection? Um, and that's, that's things like, you know, just taking time to build a bit of rapport with people to actually have some small talk, find out what you've got in common rather than focusing on, on what's different, looking for that sweet spot again. So also thinking about, well, might there be problems here because we're speaking in my first language, but your second or third language. So maybe what you're saying is not actually what you necessarily want to say. Maybe you've got some fantastic idea that you just don't have the language skills to convey fully. So maybe I should take things a little bit more slowly with you and give you a bit more encouragement. So um, I also uh, I talk about, you know, being sure about if you've heard something and you've found it to be offensive or challenging, you know, are you sure that that's what you heard? Are you sure that's really what they meant to say? Do you really think that their intention was to be that rude? So, um, so it, it's those kind of behaviours. Um, I, I list about sort of a dozen, a, a dozen of them sort of in my book. And I, I, probably my favourite is one called Discover Being Your Inner Sherlock, you know, finding your inner Sherlock Holmes. And that's you know, looking for things. So you look for things that are the same, but you also look for things that are different. And it's a game I could have used to play with, with our kids when we went on holiday and we'd go somewhere and say, right, you know, who's the first one to come up with 20 things that are different about this country? You know, and they look around and they go, oh, you know, the language is different. The, you know, the buses drive on the other side of the road or, you know, these sort of things. So, and as soon as you start doing that, as a business traveler, you would immediately think, well, I can expect that business practices are not gonna be the same. It reminds you that business practices are not gonna be the same because if everything else is so different and people are sitting by the side of the road on little plastic stools, eating bowls of noodles, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, then, you know, that's not what you perhaps see in, in London at 11 o'clock at night or, or in Paris. So, um, so it's looking for what's different, but it's also looking for where you've got that commonality. Wow, Kat, you, uh, but you have so many uh, stories uh, from your clients. And I mean, I love the way you describe your, uh, uh, the pillars you're talking about because you just, you just put a lot of stories there to make them really understandable for us. And uh, it makes sense because that's the way when you use them in real life, you can really get out the most out of them, right? So I have two questions. One is uh, a small extension of what you already spoken. And the second one is about the challenges. So, but the first one is think of the most ridiculous cultural difference you have met in your practice. <laughs> and I'm really curious to know about it. And the second question is, 
you talk about their challenges, right, between cultures, but can you share with us maybe the five most common challenges people face in the cultures and what to know about them? So this is the twofold question. You have sure, them. okay. Yeah. So um, I think probably the hardest thing to deal with in terms of cultural differences is, is when there is denial of something. Mm -hmm. And that probably went, uh, and I, as an, as an outsider, but, or even just sometimes in coaching sessions, I think that it would be really helpful for someone. So, so just to backtrack, my work's a sort of mixture of, of coaching and training. So if I'm working with, with expat clients and they're moving to a new country, there's a certain amount of information that they need, that I need to pass on to them. Not all of which they'll like. <laughs> So the coaching bit comes with, well, how can we make you more comfortable with this? And how can we make you more adaptable and, and, and better able to, um, to mold and, and adapt to a new country? So, so in my training sessions, I sometimes will find people who I think, well, I, I, I need to tell you about this because it's important and they don't want to know. So an example of that, I had a, a French man who arrived um, and when I was living in Australia and I always used to talk about the indigenous population in Australia and the story of what happened to the Aboriginal people and what has happened now. And so I started to talk about this and he said, oh, you, I'm not interested in this. Mm. And I said, well, it's quite a relevant issue in Australia. So it would be good to have some background. I'm not interested. It would have been better if they just all died. And I mm. was just like, Whoa. <laughs> and you wow. know you're face to face with someone and they're saying this awful things <laughs> like that and so but you know he was the client and so in the end I had to say oh, oh, well that's your choice I'll, I'll recommend a couple of books and if you change your mind you know you can look at them sort of later so um and so that was that's quite challenging I think when and and all you can do because you can't force your culture down someone else's throat so so I suppose what I did there by saying okay well you know I tried to sort of you know try to gently persuade him why it was important to to learn that so um but then when it didn't work it would have made more of an issue about about it than um you know I didn't want to do that so um Another issue was when I was training somebody um, who was moving to Vietnam and they were gay, uh, a, a couple of two gay guys. And, um, and I was talking about the fact that um, in Vietnam, um, public displays of affection between couples were, were not common um, and and that homosexuality was um, forbidden anyway, but that actually in, in some ways it might be easier for them because often same-sex couples in Vietnam will walk along holding hands and with their arms around each other to show their friendship. And mm -hmm. we had a, a country advisor in the session sort of with us who was Vietnamese. And I said to her, you know, isn't this right? I said, that, and the men are, are not necessarily gay, you know, they're just friends. And she said, but yes, we don't have homosexuality in Vietnam. Wow. I was like, right, okay, no, of course you don't, you know, because so, <laughs> homosexuality has got borders that it doesn't cross. You know, so. <laughs> we don't have it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, exactly. No, no. And, and, and again, that was like, well, do I sort of say, well, of course you do. I, I mean, you know, no, I didn't. When she left, you know, we all just, the three of us looked at each other and went, what can you do, you know, but... But yeah, I, I think the, I think what's really important is that you kind of recognize where you can win your battles and where you can't. And, and also, you know, there's a lot of this is about respecting whose country it is and, and who, whose town you're in. And, um, you know, that, that I may not in my own house take my shoes off at the door when I go to a dinner party because I'd feel underdressed sitting there in my socks. But if I went to someone's house in Japan, and they asked me to take my shoes off at the door, well, then, of course, I would. So um, so it's about, yes, what makes you feel comfortable. But, you know, if you know that, that's where the research is so valuable. Because if you know that when you go to 
dinner at your Japanese friend's house, they're going to ask you to take your shoes off. Well, then you're going to make sure that, you know, your toenail polish isn't all flaky or that you haven't got socks with holes in. <laughs> it's actually funny enough, but you don't have to even go to Japan. You can go to our house in France with a Lithuanian woman living there and we have the same issue. Well, there you go. <laughs> because apparently in France, well, apparently it's not the first time I see, it's not the first country I see where people are used to going inside the home with their shoes on. And me coming from Lithuania, first of all, probably it's a habit, it's a cultural thing that we always take off shoes, respecting the people who clean the house, not bringing all the bacteria, you know, inside the house. So the first time we had this conversation with my boyfriend, I was, how can you not, I said, I respect the culture. I understand it's a cultural habit. But then we sat down and we had a deep discussion around that right because my first feeling was how can you not see that i mean how can you not see it's better <laughs> to go without shoes yeah. so we had this discussion and we found the you know the the common common ground to, to to make an agreement and and i think that leads to to really the question of the of the communication you know as well uh, in this case for example how do i communicate not to offend anyone right how do i speak correctly so i think um, the next thing i would like to ask is uh, probably a bit a bit broader but about the communication cross-cultural communication what to know what's important to keep in mind and how to how to do it well yeah sure so um I do, i'm dimmy asked me two questions and i actually only replied to one of them so let me incorporate your question yeah. in into that laura because so uh, dimmy asked about sort of five most common areas of of you know likely to be problematic and communication is probably the very first in that so um so i we we don't hear necessarily what people say and mm. we don't say what people hear so um you know not just literally in that that language might be an issue but often we convey things we might convey things quite subtly we might infer things or imply things or um and they are sometimes a metaphor or they are literally sometimes just a gentler way of saying what it is that we have to say so for example in japan it's extremely unlikely that someone would come out with a direct no to something so if i said to my client um, you know how likely you know is it do you think that we could have this back from you you know some re reply back from you by the end of the week uh, you know is that possible and he will never, he or she would never say, oh, no, we couldn't do that. They would just say, hmm, we'll see what can be done. And they might kind of slightly look away while they say that. They'll give a sort of gentle smile, a bit of a nod, you know, and we'll see what can be done. And actually, when people have worked in Japan and they know Japan well, they know that that means, no, I can't do it by Friday. So it's up to me as the as the recipient of that message, if you like, to interpret that message that he's letting me down gently. He's actually saying, no, that's not going to be possible. But, you know, I'm, I'm far too polite to ever come out and say, no, I can't do that. So um, the same with, um, you know, I think, so a classic in a sort of social situation, it's that, you know, oh, we must catch up for a cup of tea sometime <laughs> or we must catch up for a beer sometime, you know, at, at what point does that become an invitation? And, you know, I think in America, people say, oh, we should have a beer sometime. And they mean it because they are very open and friendly and, you know, and they're interested in the new kid in town. You know, they, they and, and that's been my experience of sort of living there as a, having lived in England, Australia and America. I kind of use that as a bit of a, um, you know, that's my, what do they call it? The McDonald's in index, you know, as the, they look at the price <laughs> of the burger in lots of different countries. And it's like, let's have a beer sometime. Well, you know, in America, that means, yeah, let's do that. So sort of. in Australia, they love the idea of being really friendly and open. They're like, yeah, let's have a beer sometime. But it'll never happen until you actually really sort of follow it through and sort of, you know, say, let's do this. So. In England, they won't ask you for a beer until they know that they want to have a beer with you. So it might take six months. You know, in, in America, it might take six minutes sort of, but in, in England, they won't say, let's have a beer 
until they really mean it and then you'll have one mm. so um and we can as you know as an as an american you can completely misinterpret that let's have a beer because you think well that means great we're going to go tonight so so you know simple things like that can be misunderstood but um but there are you know there are lots of complexities created by by language um so i had a south african client who was told that in australia her boss told her that she was doing a pretty average job and she thought that was pretty good but actually in australia that means you know actually not doing very well at all average pretty average job means not very good at all so so she was just like oh well that, that's fine I'm, I'm doing well you know doing pretty. so uh, yeah not great but i'm okay you know and actually she was about to get fired so <laughs> so um, wow. Uh, so there are lots of sort of language difficulties and but also it's about whether communication is sort of what we call high context or low context so is it you know it's direct or indirect so um sort of it as i described with the, the scenario in japan you know it's very indirect and um it's high context in terms of it relies on your having a, a knowledge and understanding of the company and having had meetings with them before and experienced what was what you know what was going on before and therefore you would have the ability to interpret what that man said um, in a way that so he doesn't have to spell it out for them so um, uh, leadership then so so if you're talking about sort of five differences I'd say that five differences within a workplace would be um, well yeah definitely communication but sort of meet leadership and, and management styles are really critical so and again if you take at one end of the spectrum say Australia very sort of flat management style everyone addresses everybody else by their first name there's no kind of standing on ceremony the the, the team um, is there to pool ideas and to work together to progress something uh, more, more, more quickly. So, but um, in places like France, and this is this is changing now. But for for many years in France, and and I and um, um, and in places in many Asian countries as well, it's much more hierarchical. So people don't sort of act independently. They wait to be told what to do. Um, they wait to be given specific tasks to carry out and they don't always even though they might be part of a team they're not necessarily aware of what other roles people in the in the team have so um so there isn't necessarily a sort of update going around the table of who's been doing what people are just given tasks and they work sort of in much more in isolation and then report back to the boss so um so i was working with a french client and you know an old school french client um in Melbourne a few well quite a few years ago and when he arrived in Australia he asked all the he was the CEO and he asked all the members of the senior management team to give him really detailed reports about what they were doing what they were currently involved with and he saw them all sort of you know one by one and this was very atypical in an Australian management situation and it, the rest of the team really just thought that this was because he didn't trust them he didn't trust their competency um, he basically wanted to make himself aware of what they were doing so that he could fire them <laughs> you know that was kind of their interpretation so and I did a, some training for the whole management team of talking about French style and Australian style and you know there were just lots of light bulbs going on around the table and you'd think oh right okay and that's what that you know that's what that means and there were so many issues that that they had misunderstood about each other so um so yes definitely that sort of management style and and how much independence how much freedom if you like people are are given and how much they are held on a on a tight rein i just need to have a drink and coffee <laughs> coffee oh, not coffee sleepy. <laughs> see even my cup matches yeah that's Beautiful. cool you have the two colors the there. Colors. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely there's so 
while you're taking a, a sip, it's 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 so interesting this world of cultures. Wow, for me. Um, it is. Yeah, I'm just gonna blow my nose. Well, hang on a second. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, me too with with a lot of these uh, you know these these aspects because I mean Dimi like you me too you know we have we have lived I mean in, in abroad for many years yeah. how many years did you live in Denmark seven seven huh? oh. yeah okay. seven years there yeah. and so, where are you yeah. where are you from originally Dimi I'm from Bulgaria from Bulgaria okay yeah yeah, uh, yeah uh, you, you, you have, I, I'm sure you said a lot about it. Uh, I just want to include, is it body language also a very important part of these challenges? Because as we know, the communication is very important uh, on body, you know, level. So yeah, do yeah. you think it's very important there too? Do, 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 do you see that there are a lot of challenges there too? Yeah, there are. Um, probably the most, most common ones are, um, are around, um, I think eye contact is, is really common. Um, issues that some countries are very, some cultures in are very comfortable making lots of eye contact. They think it means that you're really honest and that you know, you're know you straightforward, whereas other people, um, so like Mexico, for example, they view it as quite um, aggressive to make too much eye contact. And, um, and certainly a lot of the, um, a lot of the Southeast Asian countries they won't make too much, they will fleetingly make eye contact and then sort of look away. And um, so for people who rely on eye contact to sort of feel secure, it actually makes them feel insecure. It, you know, a typical response in England, for example, if someone doesn't make eye contact is that, you know, well, they're a bit, a bit shifty, you know, a bit, they're trying to hide something. So, um, so, even just knowing that about yourself, that you are someone, you know, who is comfortable striding up to someone, putting out your hand, big smile, eye contact, you know, and, and when you read the kind of Western models about how to make a good impression with someone, that's always what you're meant to do, isn't it? You know, those, if you Google, you know, how to make a good impression, it's like, you know, walk confidently, you know, look at the person right in the eyes, you know, give them a firm handshake, you know, and you do that to your average man in Thailand, you'd be going, Whoa, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, because, you know, in places like Thailand, they have a very gentle handshake because deliberately they, they don't want to be aggressive. They don't want to be sort of too, too firm, too hard. So, um, so again, you know, not knowing those things, you think, oh, you know, like, this guy, you know, has got a really limp handshake. And, you know, we talk about people having a handshake like a wet fish in England. It's just really yeah. derogatory. We, you know, we, we just think that clearly someone who's got a, a weak handshake is, you know, less than the full man, really. It's about men here. We, we wouldn't, I don't think, have a complaint with a woman. Actually, that's not true. We, we do even. I think anyone here who's got a really weak handshake we look a bit, you know, we tend to sort of think, oh, you know, that's mm. a bit of an apology for a handshake. So, so. <laughs> I like that apology. <laughs> so, um, and then of course the other issue, you know, between um, between Muslim people is, you know, that a lot of men and women, well, women and men, I should say, they are not allowed to touch people of, um, the, of, the, of the opposite sex. So if they're not within their family group, so um, and so our natural, well, before COVID, you know, our natural tendency to shake hands with everyone that makes some people, obviously it's difficult for some people. Um, and in places like Australia, they tend to be quite huggy. So even in the workplace, you know, people will, will give each other a hug when they know each other. And it's not like a bear hug, but, it, you know, it's a sort of, bit of a you know in a mwah, mwah, sort of and and so there are people who've said to me they've had to sort of kind of create this sort of straight arm hug so that they can be like yeah okay I'm doing this but I'm not really enjoying uh, it you know, so. uh, uh. <laughs> I used to play with that in Denmark actually I used to hug everyone it's just <laughs> it's just so interesting because in my culture we also hug and right. <laughs> you just feel how people don't feel comfortable yeah I just had this little mission a bit as a joke because I felt like for some clo people closer to me, it could be a good development 
to actually learn to be comfortable with that. I was swinging around a little bit. <laughs> and it's very important because when you think about this uh, party, is that uh, I love this part of reflect of your uh, pillars because uh, when this happens, sometimes I think very often people who are not aware on that, they either think that other people are rude or they don't like them, or they think that there is something wrong with them, with the person yeah. itself, right? Yeah. There is something wrong with me, what happens here? So they don't understand that that's actually just cultural. It's nothing about you. It's nothing about that people don't like you, but they're just like this. So yeah, that's, that I think uh, releases this tension from people. Absolutely, and and it's a really good point that you make there. And I, and I see this in my expatriate training, I always talk about how it's so easy to, to make these misunderstandings, to have these misunderstandings, and then to sort of slip into this feeling almost a bit paranoid and, and that feeling that, well, people don't like me and that, you know, I'm not going to be able to make friends here. And unfortunately, you kind of get onto that downward spiral really quickly. So, it, it, which is why I, I feel it, it's so important to kind of know this before you go, so that you actually can behave in the right way, sort of straight away, as in the right way for that, for that country, not, you know, and that you no. understand that if people don't respond, it's hardly ever personal. It's just because they're seeing something different. It's like, it's like if I said to you, has a zebra got black stripes or white stripes? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way see it, right? Yeah, and I may <laughs> say, oh, well, they've got white stripes on black. And you say, oh, no, they haven't. They've got black stripes on white. Mm -hmm. And we're both right. And it's the same zebra. And that's the thing with, you know, building a relationship. Well, I have a view of how we go about building a relationship. And you have another view of it. And they're both right. So we just have to find that sort of space in the middle, that sweet spot where, where we can do that. But you know, if you don't know and you go about it completely the wrong way, then suddenly you've offended people and and you don't know why, and you don't know why what you used to, you know, back home, which worked so well, why it doesn't work for you here. So a lot of expat coaching that I provide is, it's not just about learning the business and, and the business differences, but it's also how to be an expat. So it's how to cope with that. Because don't forget, you know, this kind of, when things start to go wrong, you're already probably at a bit of a low confidence base and you've moved somewhere, you've, you've kind of lost all your connections and all your community and you may well have lost your job as well if you're an accompanying partner and suddenly you're feeling really isolated. And then when people seem to you to be unfriendly, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, what did I come here for? And this was a big mistake. And I, I, I worked with a woman in, um, in Australia, a Spanish woman, and um, I met up with her when she'd been in Australia for about three weeks. And, uh, and I said, you know, how's it, how's it going? And she said, oh, it's a disaster, you know? And I was like, well, why? <laughs> What's happening? And she said, Australians don't like me. I, I've been here for three weeks and no one's had me over to their house. So... Mm. <laughs> And, uh, you know, in, in Spain, it would be very, well, you know, you've been living in Spain, Lara, you Absolutely. know, people are very hospitable and, you know, they, they invite you to their house and they're very open and generous. And, and she had moved to Sydney and, and Australia, people don't tend to do that that much, particularly not, you know, with, with work colleagues. And I, I was working with a client recently who moved here from Brazil. And he said something about, oh, on Saturday, we've got our five-year-old daughter. Uh, our five-year-old daughter is having a birthday. So I have all my colleagues from the office coming. And I was like, well, that won't happen in England because, you know, that would, they, no one would ever invite all their work colleagues to their five-year-old's birthday party here. So, but in Brazil, it's like, oh, no, the people not do that. And there are so many differences that... Um, that you know, we, we don't know about until we actually go and live in a place. But having a bit of, of, of sort of preparation can help you to, to set off on the right foot. So I think yeah, it, it's very interesting. I think a lot of questions we have covered, it's, um, 
it also works for people who are considering to relocate, move, move abroad, live abroad. The question I have at this point is um, to look back into your home base and to those people who have lived abroad for, for a few years, for many years, and those people who decide to move back to their home country. Yeah. If we have to speak, let's say, top five aspects to consider before you're moving back to your home country, what would you say they are? What are the important things to know to prepare yourself to go back home? So, so we've lived in Australia for, um, well, we lived there all together 24 years, but last time we were there for 18 years and then we came back to England uh, nearly four years ago. And I wrote a LinkedIn post called, what makes my husband a lucky man? So, <laughs> and, and um, it was not what you think. So, <laughs> but it was basically, uh, I, I said, you know, actually what makes him lucky at the moment is that he's married to an expatriate coach who is going to help <laughs> manage his expectations around what kind of reception we're going to get back you know what we're going to get when, when we get back and you know you love to think that there's going to be this ticker tape parade and everyone's going to be like yeah they're back they're back because that's what happens when you go back on home visit and you're back in England for two or three weeks and you you know race around the country and you see all these people and everyone stops what they're doing and puts on a meal for you and you have a lovely evening and you think oh it's just gonna be like that you know all the time but you know the biggest thing you have to accept is that it's not and that that's something that happens over a short period but when you're there and you've moved back it's almost like people think oh well she'll be here you know they'll be here next week they'll be here next month so we'll do it then and somebody I was talking to recently told me that they had actually it was just a, a woman that they really wanted to see and that she said when she came over from I think she was living in India and she said when she came over she always caught up with this woman but when we she said when we moved back I just kept not seeing her and every time we had a sort of arrangement to meet one or other of us would cancel it and she said it got to two years and then she said I just thought right okay this has got to happen this time or it's not going to happen and and I think as a repatriate you have to really manage that kind of that expectation that actually and it, it and it's there's a real sense of of loss in that um because a lot of the things that you've experienced while you've been away that you are really interested in now that you're really attached to that you know you do really care about you know if you've been living in India you know you do really worry about the impact of the monsoon on you know the villages that you visited if you were coming back to England or going back to, to France, or, people don't really care in the same way. You know, it's just a sort of passing thing for them. So, so lots of the things that you want to talk about, people aren't interested in talking about. You want to share stories of places that you've been and people that you've met. And again, it's just like, yeah, well, kind of we've been doing our own thing. And the rivers just carried on flowing under the bridge. Well, you've been you know, on the bridge, if you like, in another place and the rivers just carried on flowing and you can't step back into the river where, where you left it because lots of things have changed and people have got their own lives and they're obviously much more interested really in their own lives than in yours and I think it can be really frustrating and I would say to repats the best thing you can do is find yourself some other repats because mm. you will have shared experiences because you you it feels so sad when you think you're going to really reconnect with someone that you had a lot in common with before and then you you come back and actually that whatever you had is not there anymore because you've lived very separate lives I mean it's not it's not always like that but I think you know particularly if you've been perhaps in somewhere like you know Dubai or something like that and you you know you've lived under a very different kind of lifestyle and you've you've somewhere where you've had staff you know you've had a maid and things like that and to sort of, people can very quickly assume that you've kind of got airs and graces, that, you know, that you think, oh, you know, you have to do your own, oh, you know, you have to do your own laundry, or, or they assume that because you had these privileges that you had nothing to complain about. And, um, and so I think to find other people who have been um, repats is really helpful. So groups like Internations, so internations.org, you can find 
expats, repats, wannabe expats, you know, people who've got an international mindset, it's a great place to go. And there are groups all over the world now. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and, you know, go along somewhere like that. And you will find also that, you, and I say this to expats too, when you are looking to build your friendship group, start with other expats because they're in the same boat as you and they also need to make friends whereas people who have been here for a while already you know that they, they've already got loads of friends I'm sure you know you've seen it yourselves in your in your moves um and people's dance cards you know and our grandmothers used to go off to dances and they had a little card and they'd put people's names on and there were only you know 12 dances and when the the, the dancers were filled that was it you know you they couldn't accommodate anyone else so and it's a bit like that when we're making friends you know people can only manage with so many friends and groups so and again in in the sort of expat preparation that I do it's telling people things like that it's saying don't take it personally when you want to you know you meet someone and you su suggest a coffee and they're like oh yeah that'd be great sometime but they're not specific it, it doesn't mean they don't like you it just means you're not a high priority for them at the moment so what you really have to do in that first year is be the kind of person that everyone wants to be friends with so you know you've got to throw dinners and parties and and be a really sort of fun person that everyone says oh that new girl she's great you know like <laughs> and they throw great parties you know so I want to you know so and you've just got to sort of suck it up really for the first year and you'll probably have people to dinner who you'll never see again or you might have people who you think, oh my God, it wasn't he awful. And you know, you just kind of got to go through that pain. And at the end of it, you know, you, there'll be a few diamonds left and you'll gradually d build on, on that. So, but um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, what I find so often that when I go talking to, to HR directors and so on about the work I do, if I meet someone who's been an expat themselves, they get what I offer. And, and if they haven't been an expat, honestly, I can practically say there and then this won't lead to anything because they just don't get it. Yeah. They really don't get it. So. Patty, <laughs> before, yeah, you want yeah, to say no, more? Just to say, you know, and I, I, I find that an endless source of frustration because <laughs> expat assignments are really, really expensive and an expat you know, a bit of expat coaching is, is nothing, you know, compared to the great cost. So, and I liken that to somebody buying a really expensive bicycle and then saying, well, I won't bother with the padlock. I'll save some money, you know, and it's just like, why would you spend all this money on an expat, mm -hmm. you know, probably a hundred grand or something, you know, through, you know, up to half a million, maybe on a three-year assignment for an executive. And you don't, you know, you don't give them a few hours of support to make sure that that works. Yeah, that's true, Patty. I mean, it's definitely true that people sometimes uh, believe that it's like someone who is working for productivity says, I don't have time for productivity coach. So I've heard this several times. It's like, I'm not productive, but I don't have time or money for that. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very often happening for people. Uh, before I ask you the, the, the last question uh, for today, uh, I would like to ask you this um, briefly just to describe, because some people, uh, when they go in different cultures, may, I'm sure they ask the, the, the question, um, but if I accept and fit in fully in this culture, I'm going to lose myself uh, as who I am. So just briefly say, is that true and how they can prevent it? No, I, I, I absolutely don't think it's true and I guess we come back you know at the end we come back to the sweet spot which is where we started sort of you know that you don't have to become someone else you also said in your introduction Dimmy that you know the world has changed we're all we're all you know global citizens now we're all used to working with people to to socializing with people you know from other countries we, we've many of us have lived in in other cultures a lot of us are third culture kids you know we've got parents who are from different nationalities so so i i don't think there's any question anymore that you have to mm. kind of lose yourself you just take on another bit you know it's sort of like you just start wearing clothes that are so 
when we lived in Singapore, everyone, it was, it was obviously so hot all the time. And all the expat women would wear these really brightly colored sort of quite voluminous floaty dresses, right? And when I got back to Australia with this cupboard full of these dresses, I straight away thought, I'm never going to wear any of these here. And, and so, you know, it's, it's a bit like that with your behaviors that you, you acquire something while you need it. And sometimes, you know, I, I kept a few of those dresses and sort of wore them when it was really hot around the house. And you think, well, they, you know, they're still useful to me, but you acquire things that serve you while you're there. Sometimes you like them and you keep that behavior, but otherwise it's just like if I went to France, I would speak French. If I went to Spain, I'd speak Spanish. You know, I just do things while I'm there to help me fit in. Because if I'm traveling out in the middle of nowhere in Spain and I want some directions, I have to be able to ask in Spanish. So, so when I go to work in Japan, I, if I'm aware that actually there's a lot of silence between people that, you know, I might like to chat all the time, but the Japanese people prefer to think a lot more and to sort of look out of the window and sort of mull things over in silence. I have to learn to do that. Otherwise they're just gonna be like, oh, this white noise in my head of this woman who never stops talking. So, so no, I don't think there's any need to lose yourself. Not Thank you very much, Patti, for everything you said today. Lots of information, lots of great um, advice, pieces of advice for the people, stories. Sure, people will listen to that not only once, but several times in order to get the maximum out of it, because it seems that you really know what you do and you have a lot of experience in that. Thank you for that, sharing with it, our audience. Pleasure. And, and stories are absolutely the way to go. And, and my book is not a list of, of, you know, here's how they do it in this country. It's actually, you know, his stories of real people who had mis encounters, you know, miscommunications. And then I asked the reader to sort of apply the four R's to say, well, how would you have resolved this? So, so it's kind of self-help and lots of stories. Yeah. So just a final question is in two sentences, if you, someone asks you, what are the first three things I need to do in order to um, create this cross-cultural mastery for myself? What are these three steps I have to take? Oh my God, nothing like putting me on the spot. So, <laughs> <laughs> so okay. The first thing is that you've got two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. So shut up and listen. Okay. So just, just look, look around you. So um, don't take it personally. Just if you are feeling affronted, just try to have the presence of mind to step back from what's happening and say, did they really mean to say that? Did they really mean to hurt me, to offend me? Sort of, and, and, you know, and it, they almost, you know, never will. And, and thirdly, don't expect overnight miracles. Things mm -hmm. take time. And certainly with expats, you know, it's a good 12 to 18 months before you start to feel that you are at home. And I think a lot of people really underestimate that and they think that things will happen really quickly. So, so those would probably be my, my key, my three keys. So. Thank you so much, Pat. I also want to say, say a final word. Um, I think it's been so, so much super useful information. And actually for me personally, I relate so much because to actually this year marks my 10 years of living abroad. And it's the sixth country that I'm living in within those 10 years and so many things that you have said I could um, I could see myself struggling with actually I could also see myself learning without actually knowing I'm learning because that's the only way to do and following my intuition and then I still keep having challenges after 10 years of actually having experiences with cultures you know so um, I took a few notes uh, or I took a lot of notes actually <laughs> and I, I really appreciate your time and it's been super super valuable I think even for people who have the experience people who don't have experience with you know cross-cultural situations and especially as we say today the world is getting more and more you know, mixed up, all yeah. intertwined, yeah. that I'm sure actually people should watch this, you know. Um, and, I, and I think what you say about, you know, 
that you you kind of know what to do, but you're still making the mistakes. Because I think it's a bit like, you know, if we're left or right handed, we've just we've been brought up to do things in a particular way, to, to behave in a particular way. The culture that we absorbed, you know, when we were children has taught us to have expectations. And it's really hard when you go to a different country. It's like if I suddenly said, you know, well, I'm right handed. I have to start cleaning my teeth with my left hand, you know, and you end up sticking it toothbrush in your gum and you know it's you don't feel like you've done as good a job it, it's really difficult to make this this big shift so um so you know a, again it's actually recognizing how hard it that is and not being so too hard on yourself when when you don't do that as well as as you might mm -hmm. and it takes time so, so Kathy, where, uh, sorry Patty, sorry about that Sorry about the mistake. <laughs> uh, Fatih, tell me, uh, where do people can connect with you? Where is the best place for you if they want coaching, they want just information or just yeah. find you to connect to you? Look, find me on LinkedIn probably is the, is the first thing. Um, that's the easiest way. So, um, and then, you know, please contact me from, from there. So, um uh, i don't have a website anymore um and mm. uh, but um my book is um it's distributed through a company that has print on demand everywhere so you could go to your local bookshop and ask for my book and they would have it in the next couple of days uh, or you can contact me again you know via linkedin or email patty at culturalchemistry.co.uk and um you contact me about buying a book or, or, or having some coaching and um, yeah, I would love to hear from you. And, and, you know, I guess in closing, I'd say that I do this work because I have been an expat myself and from the age of eight and, and I see how things have changed. So, so when I was eight, we moved to Belgium and my mother didn't have a phone for the first six months and she used to get, so my dad went off to his, job with with and we went off to school and you know I just think now my mum was just on her own in that apartment for hours and hours and and how hard that must have been and you know there are so many resources now um, available to people and the sad thing is that people often don't think to look for them and I, I think probably the number one thing that I do for expats is help them you know, manage expectations so they have realistic expectations about how hard it is, but also help them to see how much they can do for themselves if they actually just stop and sort of think about it. So, um, um, and because expatriation is hard, um, it is really hard, but it can be a lot easier. <laughs> it can be made a lot easier. So, um, and I, I um, you know, the other thing I'd say is that don't stress too much about learning what I call a kind of laundry list of, of do's and don'ts about cultures you know I, I think that's so stressful that idea of the old sort of older style cultural models that people you know are all like this or you know they're all really direct or they're all really you know um, chauvinistic or you know whatever those models sort of dictate use your own eyes and ears to to do your own research and then think about how you can respond to that. So, and as you said, that kind of reflection piece is, is so important. It's recognizing that actually, we, if I'm finding that difficult about them, they must similarly be finding things difficult about me. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for everything today and wish you a wonderful week and lots of success in everything you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you Bye. so much, Patty. Bye.